morning, everyone. What can corporate venture capital bring to the table? What is it good for? We're basically cutting to the chase now, the first session here. We're going to talk about all right. money. <laughs> Lots of startups here. Um, they're all um, looking for funding, I'm sure. I'm very excited to um, speak to you guys today. Um, first off, just wanted to mention that um, Sally Krawcheck, who is, who is going to be with us, uh, un unfortunately cannot. She has a very interesting story to tell about that, but we can talk a bit maybe about Ellen Bess and what she does because um, she's taken um, with that company money from uh, a number of different traditional VCs, corporate VCs, angel investors, all that kind of stuff. We're, We're talking about investor. the mix there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you guys are too. So um, very excited to do that today. And um, like they mentioned at the beginning, I'll, I have some of your questions here. If you, if you ask via Slido and, 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 and I can put it to the, to the, to the panel here. Um, so let's talk about corporate venture capital. Um, just throwing out some stats to kind of set the scene. Um, active global corporate investors have tripled since 2011. Um, and uh, 75 of the Fortune 100 companies are active in some sort of venturing, either like an official venture capital fund or they, or they in, in invest in that sort of way. Um, these, these days, venture um, deals, about 30 to 40% of them involve some corporate venture capital involvement. These, these, these numbers are, are sort of rough. And um, in terms of corporate venture capital, there's about $25 billion in funding in 2016. I saw a stat there. This is definitely a meaningful alternative to traditional institutional VCs. Um, you know, Salesforce is one of the most active ones and has been for a long time. And I think any um, you know, startup looking for money will, will come, come across these people now. So that I want to talk a bit about the distinctions, how to pitch uh, corporate venture, venture capital, whether different stages of the company, um, it makes more sense. So to start off with, let's talk, um, you know, answer the question basically that, 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 that we have, um, that we pitched to the panel here. What sets corporate venture capital apart, you know, for you, um, yeah. Matt, I mean, you know, what, how is it different and, 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 and yeah. yeah. So I think it represents a bit of an evolution of the um, venture capital industry in that, you know, yeah, vo corporate venture is a bit different um, and there's unique aspects to it. But I think if you look at most entrepreneurs now and how they think about fundraising and at the various stages that um, they're looking for investors that can add a lot of differentiation. So who you're going to look for depending on the sector you're in at an early stage and at various stages is going to be very different. And you're not just looking for money, but you're looking at who's going to be the most valuable. So at some stages, you want really smart seed investors who were individual operators in a specific area. Um, if you're at the later stage, you may want um, a specific growth equity partner. And I think that the corporate venture is, is, a, is a part of that in that it's very different, the value add that corporate venture arms can add, and some probably don't add a lot of value, and some add more value. So just like venture arms, I think it's very, some, some partners are great board members, and they're super helpful, and some are not that helpful. But the distinction with the corporate is you know, pretty obvious in that the, the, um, the help they can provide in terms of, they probably have a large customer base, they can help drive you into their channels, um, you're, you're, you know, maybe want to get acquired by them. So I think there's a lot of natural overlap. The real key thing is you have to really figure out what that value is. How do you unlock that value? What's, are they, are they good actors? Do they have a good reputation for being, uh, entrepreneur friendly? How helpful they, can they be? So I think it's, you still have to ask a lot of the same questions. Um, but I think the distinction really is that, you know, they have a large installed customer base that you want to take advantage of. Yeah, we were talking a bit backstage too about the kind of blending of these different things. It's, it's not necessarily a majorly distinct um, pot not of as money, much. right? And, 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 and maybe even in terms of the sequencing and, and, and stage of companies that, that get involved Maybe it's a bit earlier and now. It used to be a bit later with corporate venture. Is that? Yeah, I think it depends. And so, again, I think what you're so for us, we tend to invest is when we see a company that is, um, you know, starting to bump into our, our bump into Salesforce and their customers. Their customers are saying it'd be really great if you had a better integration with Salesforce. And so that's really. Uh, a really good time to you know start to think about how do I work with how do I partner with a with a corporate arm and I also think that the corporate arms particularly those that have been investing for a long time 
they behave mostly like rational investors, and so it's easier to engage with them earlier on. It's not as onerous as it was maybe historically. So I think it is easier to engage with them also at the earlier stages. Yeah, got it. Neil, first tell us a bit about Silicon Foundry because it has an interesting sort of model, and you have a very good perspective on the corporate venture capital world. You connect big companies to startups, and you've, and you've seen how this uh, space has evolved uh, yes. uh, along with your company, too. Sure, basically. sure. So Silicon Foundry, we were started in 2013 by the co-founders as well of Sherpa Capital, which is a venture fund uh, based in Silicon Valley. What we were started, uh, and our core business is we work with corporations the world over, the US, right. Europe, Middle East, and Asia, as they're trying to navigate the startup ecosystem. And they're looking to identify the most promising emerging startups and entrepreneurs because they want to engage them either as a customer, a partner, a strategic investor, or you know, as potential acquisition targets. Um, most of our members, we call them, it's, it's part of our model, they have corporate venture arms, or they are thinking about launching them, or they've launched them in the last five years. Um, and it's a very powerful tool. It's a very direct tool, right, as they're out looking at startups. And I would say many want to see the earliest of stage startups, but when they think about investing, they probably are still focused on the later stage companies. Later stage defined as, you know, this startup has a product, has a product to market, it's got customers, because they can really engage and work with them. They can then leverage all of these um, unique benefits that a corporate can bring to the table, right? Whether it's accessing that the corporate themselves as a customer or their customers in turn providing distribution and whatnot. Um, and so we've definitely seen this evolution. Um, I think there's, there's certainly a lot of, of you know, the, the right ways to both uh, imp implement a corporate venture arm and then really execute it. Um, but it is, again, it's, it's one way in, in which you can work with startups. And certainly for, as Matt was saying, you know, if you're a founder raising capital, it may, used to maybe that you would say, well, let's start talking to potential corporate uh, interest and investors in the C or D round, and now it may be as early as A. Or at the very least, let's make that connection today. If this is an early stage company, let's build that relationship, and then you, know, you can potentially go to them in right. the later rounds also. And that, and that suggests to me that, that the amount of money we're talking about in these, in these coming from corporate venture capital might be a bit smaller than it used to be. It used, it, it, I you tend to think of it as pretty big rounds, like you said, C or D. They are, they oh, are. No, right. I mean, I, and I think the um, one, another stat, and you had a lot of good uh -huh. stats, right? A thousand corporate venture arms, 250 of which were active in the first half of this year. Um, one of the stat I was referring to is the corporate venture valuations, or the, the rounds where corporates involved are 30% higher. Uh, than others, so that is indicating they're probably also larger rounds and somewhat slightly later stage. When we have corporates who want to see really early stage companies, usually it's it's for you know insights and discovery and awareness. Um, but that being said, you know the other element that that is complementary to corporate venture and intertwined in many cases is where they're doing accelerator programs, right? So maybe they're they're uh, working with cohorts of early stage companies. Um, and yet, at the same point, we've seen some of those accelerators, like Disney, started mm -hmm. earlier stage, and then now they've really transformed it to work with established companies that have raised you know, institutional venture dollars, right. where they know they can take that company, they can take it into their organization, and that organization can then really work with them and do the, the kind of deals that then provide you know, a step function right. uh, in their progress. So, you know, the question that often comes up now is, if, so, sort of, why, why are, corporates doing this, if they wanted, you know, the pure kind of venture capital exposure and they're looking for returns and that kind of stuff, which is probably not the case, but like they would just, those people would just launch a traditional Or you'd invest in a fund directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, uh, so, yeah. well, I think what you're seeing is um, that, um, you know, I'll separate two things. I think what's unique about Salesforce is, you know, we are a platform company, so it's very easy for startups to build on our platform. Um, either through our enterprise app store or on one of our force.com Heroku and then plug those products into Salesforce, sell into our user base and create a unified user experience. And so like that go to market um, and how we're helpful to those companies is very, very clear and very, very easy. And I think um, we are a tech company. So for us to be involved in the tech space is, is pretty clear. I think what you're seeing in a lot of industries, though, is that every industry is becoming a tech-enabled business. So I meet with a lot of customers, 
whether they're in the industrial sector or wherever, their business or retail, their business is getting disrupted. And so, and it's getting disrupted by Amazon and um, you know, outsourced manufacturing. And so they're looking for higher value added services. And those are all being driven by software. So I think when Andreessen said software is eating the world, that, that's really what that means. And so in order to get their arms around that, one of the best ways is through corporate venturing. And so I think that's really why you're seeing this continued increase in corporate venture arms. I think the challenge is, and the thing that's really hard to figure out, and I think this is where Neil is very helpful, is kind of why I use the example of Salesforce. It's very clear how we can help startups, how you can plug into our ecosystem, and how we can take advantage of that. If, if for every investment we make, we have a GM who's had a product who, if we're not going to build or buy something, and we invest in a company and we partner with them, our customers are happy because they're getting access to this innovation that we didn't develop, the GM now has this, this you know, really good strategic partner that's solving that need. The customer's getting access to all this through one you know, unified platform that is Salesforce. But if you don't have that platform approach, you have to be very thoughtful then of like, okay, how can I actually work with this company and take advantage of it? And I think it's a really, really hard thing to do. And I think that's where you know, the things that, that Neil and his team do are really valuable because they can help companies Maybe it's not even investing, but help them come to Silicon Valley. Well, I'll let you talk yeah, about yeah, it, but, <laughs> but, but I think that's why they're incredibly valuable. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, what, one, one question that's, that's, that's here and, and that I also have too is, 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 is how corporate venture funds source investments. Is it, is it any different? I mean, obviously, somebody like Silicon Foundry could help with that, yeah, but, yeah. but I wonder if the approach yeah, is... It's going to be different for us than probably a lot of his customers. Right. Yeah. Yes. I, I think the sourcing is very much the same as an institutional VC, uh -huh. right? It's being out in the market, having entrepreneurs understand what are your focus areas, what stage do you like to play at, how do you engage, and what value can you bring to them? Um, perhaps corporate VCs also end up uh, de facto sourcing from their teams around the world, right? The, the broader organization. I was in corporate development at Adobe, and we were doing and Macromedia previously, and we were doing investments off the balance sheet. And we would get phone calls from the GM in Asia, right, who was saying, "Hey, here's the startup you got to check out," because they may be seeing it in the sales uh, situation. But I think the sourcing is the same, and ultimately it boils down to visibility across the ecosystem, and of course with the most, um, the most promising entrepreneurs, right? Because yeah. just like institutional VCs, yeah. you want to work with the best companies, which yeah. goes back to maybe 500 companies in a category, but ultimately it's who are the top five. But, yeah. but I, think, I think Neil's being a bit modest here <laughs> in that. So for us, we're based in Silicon Valley. Um, our CEO, Mark Benioff, is um, you know, an entrepreneur. Many of the GMs were acquired in or started with Salesforce. So we're in that startup ecosystem. Yeah. We're, you know, I, we have probably 50 portfolio companies within five blocks of our office. Everyone's coming into Silicon Valley. So for us to source is very different than, you know, someone who's not based in Silicon Valley. And I think that's where, yeah. you know, groups like Neil, if, if you're coming in from, you know, uh, Tennessee, I grew up in Kentucky, so I can, I can talk about different regions like this. But if you're coming in, you're just not seeing these companies, so it can be a lot overwhelming. Or if you're coming in from Europe, potentially. So having someone, a, 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 you know, a guy that can help you navigate and say, look, these are the conversations we can have. We can, it, it, otherwise, you're just you're talking to so many random people. Yeah. There's a hundred startups, and it's really hard to, to I think, filter the filter what's the quality. Right. Yeah. So, is it true though that the underlying kind of interest of a corporate venture fund is an acquisition eventually? You know, I mean, this this is the thing. Like, it, yeah. If you're not going with a traditional VC and you're going with a corporate VC, is it not sort of looming always that you well, could be yeah. acquired eventually, because yeah. why else would yeah. Salesforce, Google, Intel, I, whoever wants to be involved? I could talk involved. about Salesforce yeah. generally, yeah. specifically, and yes. you can talk more generally. So um, at Salesforce, it's not. So we've made over 250 yeah. investments. Um, we've had 50 companies that have been acquired. Um, we've had nine IPOs. We've only acquired a small handful of companies. And again, because of the nature of us being a platform company and having an enterprise application store, we can effectively partner with these companies and get a lot of value out of it mutually without having to acquire. It does give us a lot of insight into the market. It helps inform us, um, but it's very beneficial for both sides. I think that you're kind of hitting on the point and what I kept getting back to is like, 
you know, how do you create a, uh, a relationship that's mutually valuable for both sides? I don't know yeah. what you're seeing with other companies. I think absolutely very much the same, right? I think you'd find, you'd be hard pressed to find many corporate venture arms who say, we're, our job is try before you buy. Our job is to take a stake because it's going to lead to an acquisition. I think, you know, in many of the cases we're seeing, it's, we plan to be a big customer of this company. You know, as a part of that, we'd like to invest. Okay. We have insights into them. We have ability to have influence on their product roadmap. And by the way, we're going to be a big customer. We get to capture some of that upside value that we're creating by the very nature of, of you know, writing a $10 million check mm -hmm. that it turns into revenues for them. But I, I think a really important point, though, is if you think that that is going to be a good acquirer, it's better to have that relationship earlier. And I think this is the mistake. Okay. And, and I know there's... Um, very prominent investors, I think, who've given companies bad advice. It's like, don't engage with corporate arms yeah. unless you're ready to sell. And, and I don't know why people would say that, because it makes absolutely no sense. It's it, like when you're doing an acquisition, it is like a marriage. You're going to be together for a long time. A whole bunch of stuff mm -hmm. has to work out. And if we're not familiar with you, if we haven't been working with you, and you're like, hey, we're in a sale process. You know, we have, like, we're, we're in prolonged discussions. You maybe have two or three weeks we're not going to buy that company. And so versus, hey, we've been working with you. Our product teams know each other. We've done these integrations. Here's how we work in the field. Our sales teams know one another. It's an entirely different discussion. And I just think that point is, is lost on, right. on even on uh, institutional VCs who would say, oh, don't take corporate. I think that's changed a lot, but that was sort of the mantra. Yeah. Yeah. And in the past, they say you might have seen some corporate venture uh, investments in the term sheet having right of first refusals and whatnot. Their you owners never, terms. And you won't yeah. see it from oh, okay. the most sophisticated corporate venture investors. Right. From, from the corporate perspective, I'm, inter I'm interested to hear this too. What's the decision to... to to go with kind of a, a venture capital approach investment versus an internal um, so development kind internal. of thing, right? Because I mean, it's, ours it's, is all off of the balance sheet. I okay. am part all right. of so the corporate. So it's kind of the internal and I think this incubation is where, process. Yeah, and I think this is actually where I'm very helpful is I am part of the corporate development team. Oh. I don't lead M&A and acquisitions, but I understand everything that we're thinking about buying. And often these conversations we have are very dynamic I where I can help fund companies, guide companies, and help them think through acquisitions if they want us to acquire. Um, and often investment conversations will lead to M&A. M&A conversations will lead to investments. And it gives us a lot of flexibility in working with companies. Is that, is that common, Neil? Or, or uh, I, I, I think there's a, there's a fair few corporate funds that are very, very separate and yes. have nothing to do with I think that, and many of them start as they are, you know, sole LP or they're straight off the balance sheet, and then some of them raise outside capital, Sapphire Ventures and a few others. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's rare in the grand scheme. You know, out of a thousand firms, there's probably five or ten that you'd put in that category. And on the flip side, many start out as a function of corporate development, and they're doing opportunistic investments off the balance sheet, and they get to a point where they say, you know, we should we should formalize this. We should we should name it, um, and we should structure it in a way that it's obvious externally that this is going to be an ongoing activity and one that has senior commitment for the long term. Yeah, but I think you're hitting on the crux of the challenge: is you are a corporate venture arm. Uh, so there's an expectation that you make money, but are you strategic? And I feel like what happens is corporate venture arms sort of are a bit muddied in what their primary objective yeah. is. Mm -hmm. We're 100% strategic. Google, I would say, is an, an extreme. They're you know, principally financially motivated. I yeah. think they do a great job, so it's not a negative on them. I think if you're sort of neither here nor there, um, you still have to make returns. But I think if, and, and you know, hap very proud of our returns, but I think if you're neither here nor there, the value that you're kind of a little conflicted in like what's the value that you're trying to provide to those companies right. you're working with. Kind of a follow-up question to that from the, from the audience. What's, what's wrong with having a right of first refusal in a, in a corporate investment? Well, effectively, it limits your, your exit paths, mm. right? Uh, it's a signaling effect. Uh, and so you as the entrepreneur, uh, taking money from an investor that would have that term in is, is almost universally a no-no. Um, and, and the best event, you know, institutional investors, if they see that term um, being applied to a potential new investment, you know, they're going to go a different route. So that's the, yeah. Uh, yeah. the downside you, to a if, rover. If you're an acquirer, you're not going to spin up a whole process just to know that, and because it takes a ton of energy and yeah. a lot of resources internally, you're not going to spin that up just knowing that this other team that has all the insight and right of first refusal can just like come in and undercut you at the last minute. Yeah. Right. 
Um, so to get you know detailed, all these all these wonderful startups around us, is there a different way to pitch a corporate venture fund than there is a traditional fund, or or, yes. or if you're coming out of the angel round or seed round, yeah. I mean, is it what should they think of uh, if if I, if they yeah. decided to go the corporate? I route? think the mistake that we see a lot is someone comes in and says, "Hey, you're a big sales force, like." How can you help me? And that's a really bad <laughs> way to yeah. start the conversation. Vague. And I think it's a it's it's really if if you don't have an idea of how you can help Salesforce customers, we can then you know work with you and figure out how we can best both work together. But you know our product managers, our sales teams, they have a bunch of different products, a def bunch of different priorities to have a, a, a startup rise to the top of the stack in something that you're going to get a meaningful relationship in the field. You need to be able to come and help tell that story, um, and then you know, and, and, it, and it translates to post investment is that you really have to really focus and have a team that's that, or at least a person that's dedicated to that relationship. So you need to you need to have that narrative of like this is what how I can help Salesforce and Salesforce can help me, Makes sense. or whatever your corporate is. Yeah, it's 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 the do your homework right before you go in, and the parallel with institutional VCs right is you look at the fund, look at the kind of companies they've invested in, the categories, the sectors, which partner has led those investments. It would be the same thing with a corporate, which is here's how I think I can help your business, and, and in the reverse, here's how I think if you were an investor in my business that I think that you would add value to it. Yeah, we we talked a bit about um, at the at the beginning throwing out those stats about about how hot let's say corporate. Uh, VC is now. If a startup is looking to take money from that, should they be maybe slightly worried that we're in kind of a faddish sort of stage now? Like, what happens if you take corporate venture capital money, yeah. cycle turns, CFO decides, like, why are we spending money on all these kind of tangentially related companies? Like, right. what happens then? Is that, is that part of, like, the, the, the founders' due diligence that they need to do? I think, I think it is. I mean, if yeah. you've been in the ecosystem long enough, we've seen the movie before. I think it's no different than, than an emerging manager, right? A, a new institutional venture fund. And so if, you're, if it's a corporate who's just announced and launched a new fund, you, know, you don't know what is the staying power of that fund, what's the commitment to the CEO, CFO, and the board to it. That's certainly not a concern of the case with the, the top you know, decile of corporate venture funds who have been at it for years and years and years in the, in the highs and the lows from a macro standpoint. But it, it's a consideration. Um, and also is, here's the champion uh, who's leading my deal. And again, it would be the exact same case whether or not you're talking institutional and corporate, which is, are they going to be around? Are they going to yeah. be my champion? Are they going to be my, that's going to be my partner who's helping me build this business you know, in the years to come. Yeah. And that's, that's also why we don't lead rounds. I mean, I'm not worried about Salesforce Ventures going away tomorrow, but typically I think a healthy relationship, there's exceptions we do lead from time to time, but um, corporates a lot of times don't lead. So, and that's, he that's healthy for a whole host of reasons. So if for whatever reason, let's say we invest and, um, you know, product paths diverge, we lose our executive sponsor, the relationship didn't work out how we expected, if we're leading and writing a large check, and I think this is the case for a lot of corporates, and for whatever reason you're not following on, that's a really bad signal to the market. Um, and so I think, and, and, and on the flip side, you can mitigate a lot of the concerns that institutional VCs and entrepreneurs have by when you're working with corporates. Again, there's cases where it does make sense to lead, and I'm, so I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I think that's, that's so when you think about different ways to manage the perceived risk of corporate. It's look at the terms like right or first refusal. You know, should, are you going to give them a board seat? Like, you know, mm -hmm. that has a lot of issues. Um, are they going to lead? So I think you, you look at all those things and you can, you can manage a lot of that perceived risk and how you structure the deal and what the right. role is. It's, am I right in thinking it's pretty rare to say raise funds only from a corporate venture capital fund? Like, like you were saying, they, they tend to team up with others or with traditional VCs or with other types of investors, is that? I think that's right. I mean, less it's rare. less rare today than it used okay. to be, but fundamentally it's a syndicate business, right? right? Um, particularly for the companies who make it on through and end up raising rate of rounds. But certainly there's the soft banks of the world uh, and others yeah. who are you know, taking lead positions, taking entire rounds. Um, but I and think most companies, it's part of a diverse syndicate. And you've seen it also in, in financial services and highly regulated industries where you'll get a consortium yeah. of all of the, the biggest players or a significant portion of the biggest players to all chip in a, a little bit of money. And I think that's a healthy dynamic as yeah. well. 
And, and you won't have institutional investors right. sometimes. I mean, that, right. that does remind of, you know, there is that concern some companies have is that I take money from Samsung and I've kind of made my bed uh, as a, an example, right, uh -huh. which is I'm no longer Switzerland. But in a lot of these cases, yeah. whether it's financial services or telcos, you'll see a company take it from two or three or four as a consortium. And yeah. it's obvious they're working with everybody. Yeah. Right. But on the, on the flip side, I would say, you know, it works in like financial services and some of the regulated industries. Um, to take uh, a bunch of money from a lot of corporates, you, mm -hmm. the value you're going to get generally, again, unless you're building some fabric that's going to go ac across a specific industry, if you're taking from a bunch of corporates, you're probably, you can't dedicate enough resources to work with all those. You, you probably should, in, in the earlier stages, only be working with one or two, maybe three. Um, and you need the team and the resources. And you also, if you're working with a bunch of those um, companies as well, and you take a bunch of money, there's less of an incentive for each of the individual companies too. So there's a, right. there's a bit of a balance. Right, yeah, I mean, like, like we t talked about around the pitching, the pitch needs to be tailored to the corporate. How That's can you right. help Salesforce, how can you help Intel? If there's a big group of those, it'd be hard to, to help all yeah. those things. We, we, we don't have much time left, but I wanted to sort of, to kind of wrap up maybe a, a, a minute each, this is the kind of overarching question that we have here, is you're a founder, how do you decide, how do you suss whether you want to pursue venture, traditional inst institutional venture money versus corporate venture funds? Like, you know, in a, in a nutshell, what should, you know, the two, three things people think um, about when they're deciding which route yeah. to go? Well, I would say don't take it... venture capital at all unless you have to because <laughs> it's incredibly expensive and too many businesses take venture capital that have no business taking venture capital to start with. Um, but then I think it's, who is the, the one or two most strategic partners in your ecosystem? Start to develop those relationships. Early. Early, and then figure out when the right time is to make an investment. So it's, it's a, an extension of the overall partner discussion, not it's not an either or, it's part of that partnership discussion. Right, I completely agree, right? It's not mutually exclusive, that's the good news, right? Okay. And it really is, it's mapping out your universe of who could add the most value to your business on the operating side and in terms of the institutional VCs and then going out and targeting with them. And whether it's a corporate or institutional VC, you start that relationship as early as possible, they can follow you, and then when it comes to investment or as you were talking about earlier, M&A, you know each other, you said, here's what I'm gonna do, well, here's what I did, I did it, and then the deal ultimately moves much faster, whether that's investment or another outcome. Right, excellent, thanks. Well, thanks a lot, guys. That was a really good way, I think, to, to start the conference. I'm sure you're around and would love to hear from all, yeah. the, all the startups right. here. Uh, Neil helps helps connect uh, big corporates with, with startups, and uh, like, like we said with Matt, Salesforce is, is, is one of the busiest corporate venture funds out there, so I'm sure you have your, your tentacles all over um, we do. The, the, um, the conference here. So thanks again, Matt and Neil, and uh, thanks everyone for Thank listening. You. Thanks. Right.